multiple deaths as explosions rocked two buildings overnight in Tianjin. Salary reduction wave hits. Beijing demands belt tightening as medical workers nationwide experience collective pay cuts. Exposure of scandal in Chinese scientific community. Academic titles bought and sold for money. Facing dire crisis, she unusually calls out rely on ourselves to survive. What awaits Beijing? Numerous super fireball meteors descend. United States makes a comeback, rejoins UNESCO to counter CCP influence. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Multiple deaths as explosions rocked two buildings overnight in Tianjin. On the evening of June 13, severe explosions occurred almost simultaneously in two residential complexes in Tianjin's Hadong district, resulting in multiple casualties, injuries, and extensive damage to the entire buildings. In the early hours of the 14th, the Hadong branch of the Tianjin Public Security Bureau issued a notification stating that on the 13th at around 2010, explosions occurred in room 301 of building 5, number 13, Yuan Suizhongli in room 603 of building 2, number 6, Finchili, in the Hadong district. The explosions resulted in the death of three people, multiple injuries, and damage to some houses. The notification also stated that the suspect, Mr. Ma, male, 46 years old, has been captured, and he used fireworks as the means of crime in two different buildings within a span of approximately five minutes. However, it remains unclear how he was able to orchestrate such incidents, as the Yuan Suizhongli and Fingqili residential complexes in Tianjin's Hadong district are located about two kilometers apart from each other. The case is still under investigation. However, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, is notorious for concealing the truth in official reports. Some netizens remain skeptical about whether fireworks alone could cause such a large-scale explosion and whether only three people died at the scene. Numerous videos circulating online show the scene of the explosion in complete chaos. One building appears to have flames bursting from windows on the third floor, with severe damage throughout the entire building. Balconies, doors, and windows are shattered, and the ground below is scattered with debris and wood. Another building is also severely damaged, with broken balconies surrounding it. The corridors are filled with debris, and there are bloodstains within one unit. Videos also show a long line of ambulances outside the building, indicating a potential high number of casualties. There is currently speculation that the suspect's motivation for the crime stems from social animosity. Mainland Chinese society is witnessing an increasing wave of social hostility, accompanied by a series of disturbing murder cases. On March 25, a gas explosion occurred at 45, Taiping North 3rd Street in Daowai District, Harbin City, Heilongjiang Province. Videos circulating on the internet depict numerous aluminum alloy windows in the residential building shattered, deformed, and detached, while several vehicles and nearby structures also suffer damage. As per the official report, one fatality and seven injuries were reported. Subsequently, mainland media, citing insider information, revealed that the explosion was triggered by a laid-off bus fleet supervisor in Harbin City. Motivated by his simmering grievances, he set fire to the gas in his residence as an outlet for his pent-up anger. Salary reduction wave hits. Beijing demands belt tightening as medical workers nationwide experience collective pay cuts. The Chinese authorities have repeatedly called on central departments and local governments to tighten their belts and prepare for long-term tightening of the belt, including hospitals that have been heavily impacted during the three-year pandemic. Recently, headlines such as salary reduction wave hits medical staff, massive salary reductions, and clinical staff reduced by 800, administrative staff reduced by 300 have been constantly appearing in the media. According to a non-anonymous online survey conducted on a doctor's community forum with the participation of 2,630 users, more than 66% of users stated that their hospitals have implemented salary reductions. Since 2023, the income of some doctors has recovered to the level of 2019, but the additional workload has not translated into income. Moreover, the interviewed hospitals have been cutting costs, saving resources, and sending signals of cost reduction. 
Dr. Wang Sini, pseudonym, an intensive care physician at a tertiary hospital in a prefecture-level city in East China, said, compared to 2019, my current income is lower. Previously, an attending physician would earn at least tens of thousands per month, but in April, I only received seven to 8,000, at least a 30% reduction. There have also been reductions in other income sources, such as night shift pay, which has decreased from 200 yuan per day to only 20 yuan, about 2 US dollars and 97 cents. Wang Sini mentioned that in recent months, the most discussed topic among colleagues has been salary reductions, as their take-home pay is gradually decreasing by a few hundred yuan each month. Some colleagues have recently gotten married and need to support housing loans, while others have family members such as children or elderly parents to take care of. The decreasing income month by month has led to a pervasive sense of anxiety. Reports indicate that even in hospitals and departments experiencing increased patient volumes, doctors are often facing a subtle form of salary reduction. Their workload has increased, but their income hasn't risen accordingly. On March 1 this year, during a press conference held by the State Council Information Office of the Communist Party, Liu Kuen, the Minister of Finance, stated, we must remain unwavering in the practice of tightening belts in party and government organs. Liu Kuen emphasized that tightening belts is not a short-term measure but a long-term policy guideline. In fact, as early as 2019, the Communist Party authorities issued multiple notices, urging governments at all levels to tighten their belts and prepare for tight days. Recently, several regions in China have initiated large-scale cleanups of non-staff personnel in government institutions and public service units. Some Chinese scholars believe that non-staff and staff members are closely related, and after clearing non-staff personnel, further reductions in staff members may follow. Additionally, local finances are strained due to the three-year-long pandemic and economic downturn, leading to increased fiscal expenditures. Clearing non-staff personnel can help alleviate the financial burden. Exposure of scandal in Chinese scientific community, academic titles bought and sold for money. A recent scandal involving the buying and selling of academic titles of academicians has rocked the scientific community in China. Rao Yi, the president of Capital Medical University exposed the phenomenon of monetary bribery in the election process of academicians at the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Engineering on his WeChat public account, Rao e Science. In an article titled The First Step in Reforming the Election of Academicians, Receiving and Submitting Bribes, Rao e pointed out a serious problem existing in the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Engineering, where in each round of elections since the beginning of this century, candidates have directly bribed academicians with voting rights. He also hinted that current academicians were well aware of the situation where bribers were elected as academicians, as many existing academicians in various disciplines not only received monetary gifts but were also fully aware of this fact. However, after Rao Yi's disclosure sparked extensive discussion, his article was deleted and reposts on other Chinese websites were blocked. Regarding the allegations of bribery and corruption in the election of academicians raised by Rao Yi, the Chinese Academy of Sciences responded that Rao Yi Science can provide official evidence and clues related to bribery and corruption in the election process. Rao Yi, a renowned Chinese biologist, aged 61, formerly served as the Dean of the School of Life Sciences at Peking University and currently holds the position of President at Capital Medical University. It is worth mentioning that in 2011, Rao Yi, as the Dean of the School of Life Sciences at Peking University, participated in the selection of academicians at the Chinese Academy of Sciences but was eliminated in the first round. Subsequently, Rao Yi announced on Weibo that he would no longer participate in the election of academicians and hinted at the well-known reasons for his failure to be selected. Facing Dire Crisis, Eleven Unusually Calls Out Rely on Ourselves to Survive Xi Jinping, the top leader of the Chinese Communist Party, delivered an unusual message during his recent visit to Inner Mongolia, calling for self-reliance as a means to survive. Xi's remarks have once again become a hot topic of international discussion. As reported by the official media of the Chinese Communist Party on June 10, Xi Jinping conducted a visit to Inner Mongolia from June 7 to 8. While inspecting the Zhongwan Industrial Park in Hohod, 
he emphasized the imperative of high-level technology for self-sufficiency and the establishment of a new development paradigm to overcome technological obstacles. He further stated that amidst various foreseeable and unforeseeable storms and waves, it is crucial to prioritize our own responsibilities. If you search online, you can find that in the past five years, Xi Jinping has issued similar warnings no less than ten times, and the frequency has been increasing. Commentator Yushan believes that this can only indicate that Xi Jinping himself senses an increasingly critical situation for the party's survival. It is more like a warning, or even a threat, to the party members sitting on the same sinking ship, the storm is coming, and the ship is about to capsize. Under the pressure of the United States and its allies, the Chinese Communist Party finds itself in a predicament. Particularly in areas such as semiconductors, China's attempts to break free from being choked by countries like the United States and the West have yielded minimal results. During his inspection, Xi Jinping reiterated the need to promote the dual circulation strategy, emphasizing the importance of strengthening the domestic market. He stated, when others refuse to open the door for us, we must rely on ourselves to survive and thrive. He also criticized certain countries' pursuit of hegemony and monopolies. However, he quickly shifted his tone and stated that China is open to cooperation with any country, welcoming collaboration. Economic globalization is the right path, and win-win cooperation is the best approach. In response to this, seasoned commentator Professor Zhang Tianliang pointed out that Xi Jinping has a tendency to use phrases like both, and in his speeches. He wants to prioritize both the domestic market and maintaining international integration. It's similar to his previous remarks about implementing lockdowns while promoting economic development. However, this is an impossible task to accomplish. Professor Zhang Tianliang explains, because the world's economies are deeply interconnected, with global industrial supply chains. If others don't provide you with crucial technologies or key products, it will be impossible to ensure the normal operation of your domestic economy. Therefore, the idea of relying solely on the domestic market is a far-fetched notion. Political commentator Zhong Yuan pointed out in an article for the Epoch Times on June 9 that in the past two months, the United States' orders from China have reached an all-time low. With China's economy in a dire state and unemployment rates continuing to rise, it seems that the realization of the domestic circulation concept is unattainable. The Chinese Communist Party's top leadership should once again change their rhetoric and return to the concept of dual circulation encompassing both domestic and international aspects. Zhong Yuan said, Inner Mongolia may have been considered by the senior Chinese Communist Party officials as a fallback plan for extreme situations. However, the domestic and international situations are extremely challenging, and the party leadership is actually at a loss. What awaits Beijing? Numerous super fireball meteors descend. Around 1.30 a.m. Beijing time on June 13, numerous videos circulating online show that several fire meteors fell in the night sky of Beijing. Among them, two to three meteors had a higher brightness and continuously burst into flames during the falling process, trailing long tails of fire and illuminating the night sky. Unlike the previous occurrence of fire meteors in Beijing, there has been no reporting by mainland Chinese media this time. Prior to the early morning of March 27, a large number of videos circulated online showing a dazzling fire meteor streaking across the sky of Beijing, emitting a dazzling blue light and then bursting into a red flower, illuminating the night sky several times before falling. At that time, several mainland Chinese media outlets reported on the incident. Ancient Chinese believed that the fall of meteorites from the sky was an omen of significant events about to happen. Fire meteors were generally regarded as a precursor to social turbulence and were often associated with changes in political power. One notable event occurred in 1976 when a large meteorite fell on a rare occurrence in Jilin, coinciding with the successive deaths of Chinese Communist Party leaders Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and other high-ranking officials. Some internet users also believe that the falling of fire meteors is an inauspicious sign for the Chinese Communist Party but a good omen for the Chinese people. United States makes a comeback, rejoins UNESCO to counter CCP influence. 
After nearly six years of withdrawal from UNESCO, the United States has informed of its interest in rejoining the organization in a letter submitted on June 8. Amid escalating tensions between the United States and China in various fields, this move is seen as the latest action by the United States to counter China, particularly in the establishment of rules for artificial intelligence within international organizations. As a founding member of UNESCO, the United States has been a major contributor to its budget, providing up to 22% of the organization's funding before its withdrawal. A dispute over the acceptance of Palestine as a member country has persisted for the past 10 years since 2011. In March of this year, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken mentioned in a budget briefing to Congress that China has become the largest single donor to UNESCO, and the absence of the United States has given China an opportunity to shape the rules for artificial intelligence. He believes that the United States should rejoin UNESCO and participate in the formulation of rules for artificial intelligence. Professor Yao Yuan, Chair Professor of International Studies at St. Thomas University, said, In fact, for the establishment and maintenance of the entire global order, the United States, as the world's largest economy and military power, does not want to be absent. Under the Biden administration, it hopes that through such participation, it can ensure its dominant role in the evolution of these new institutions, or at least participate in and understand the future direction of the world. He added, it's an exaggeration to simply say that the United States' participation represents its suppression of China. In the past, the United States was relatively lenient in allowing China's infiltration into international organizations. However, the ongoing struggle between the United States and China will inevitably lead the United States to seek greater involvement and balance with China in international organizations. Professor Shen Rongqin of York University, Canada said that, certainly, the competition between the United States and China in AI is extremely intense. So, this action is simply part of the technological warfare between the United States and China. Audrey Azoulay, the Director General of UNESCO, announced the United States' return during a special meeting, stating that it is a strong action based on trust in UNESCO and multilateralism. The United States' re-entry will be determined by a vote among the 193 member countries of the organization next week. In response to the United States expressing its intention to return, the Chinese Communist Party responded with derision and sarcasm. The spokesperson for the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mao Ning, recently stated that international organizations are not a battlefield for geopolitical games. She also mentioned that the United States should prioritize reviewing its own behavior of twice breaking agreements and withdrawing from organizations. Don't forget to comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths.